This episode of Beyond the Uniform is sponsored by Warfighter Hemp, whose mission is to provide our nation's veterans with organic, non-addictive, non-psychoactive means to manage pain, lower anxiety, and improve the overall quality of their lives. 50% of Warfighter Hemp's profits go back to veterans. In episode number 218, I spoke with Warfighter Hemp's founder, Steve, and since then, I've been a fan of both their company and their products. Warfighter Hemp is offering Beyond the Uniform listeners 20% off their first purchase using the promo code BTU20 at checkout. That's BTU20. Thanks and enjoy today's episode. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and my goal is to help military veterans succeed in their civilian career. Today's episode number 299 with Chef Robert Irvine. When somebody says no, that's like a red flag to a bull to me. You know, I've got to exhaust every opportunity to prove that they're wrong. Not to them, not to make them look bad. To me, as a challenge to me to say, well, here are the obstacles. The military has taught me to do this. Let me look at the options. And touch wood, everything I've done, I, I attack like that, including restaurants, food lines, helping people on the shows. You know, what is the, the end goal in mind and work backwards? Well, I'm going to start off today with Robert's bio because I only had a limited time with him and you'll understand why he travels 345 days a year. And I was very, very fortunate to talk with him amidst an extremely busy schedule. And so I wanted to save his bio for the intro so that I'd have as much time for the conversation to, to focus on the interview. So here is a quick background on Robert. With more than 27 years in the culinary profession, Chef Robert Irvine has cooked his way through Europe, the Far East, the Caribbean, and the Americas in hotels and on the high seas. He hosts the Food Network series, Restaurant Impossible, where he saves struggling restaurants across America by assessing and overhauling their weakest spots. He also previously hosted Dinner Impossible and Worst Cooks in America. Robert has authored two cookbooks, Mission, Cook, and Impossible to Easy, and one healthy living book, Fit Fuel, A Chef's Guide to Eating Well and Living Your Best Life. He tours with his interactive live show, Robert Irvine Live, and appears regularly as an expert guest on national morning and daytime talk shows. Um, that is a very, very brief bio. I wanted to add a little bit more. Uh, in 2015, he launched Robert Irvine Foods, a company that features a nutritionally improved line of food products without compromising great taste. He recently established his eponymously named nonprofit organization, the Robert Irvine Foundation, in an, event, in, in an effort to support military personnel and their families. And, and you'll learn in this interview, I mean, he, he does over 150 events a year to help the USO. He goes above and beyond to give back. In recent years, he was honored with two very distinguished recognitions for his dedication to the armed services. His first was being designated Honorary Chief Petty Officer by the U.S. Navy, and later that year awarded the Bob Hope Award for Excellence in Entertainment and Support of Our Service Members, bestowed on him by the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. Continuing his support of the military, Robert became the first celebrity chef to open a restaurant, aptly named Chef, chef Robert Irvine's Fresh Kitchen at the Pentagon in the fall of 2016. His other recent projects include the Robert Irvine Magazine in May 2016, the opening of a new Gold's Gym in Largo, Florida in January 2017, and the opening of a new restaurant in Las Vegas at the Tropicana in late 2017. So much to be impressed with here, but overall, I think I'm most blown away by Robert's humility and by his incredible generosity. Uh, there are a ton of reasons to listen to today's episode, but I'd rather us just dive in. There is something in here for every single member of the military and, their, and the military community. Um, as always, at beyondtheuniform.org, in the show notes for this episode, you will find links to everything we discuss, Robert's books, his shows, lots of other great stuff in, that, in there. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Robert. 
Well, Robert, to start off our interview, um, your passion for cooking started in an early age. Uh, you enlisted in the Royal Navy at the age of 15 and served for 10 years. What was it about cooking in the Royal Navy that attracted you to this life? Well, first of all, it wasn't the cooking in the Navy that attracted me. It was really interesting. I started a home economics class at school, and I wasn't a very good student, but food seemed to interest me. So I joined this home economics class. There was 30 girls and me. And that was the real reason I started cooking. Um, I made my first quiche Lorraine. I took it home. I was amazed that eggs and pastry, cheese, cream, and onions could make a meal and change somebody's uh, mood. I was already in the Sea Cadets for about five years, um, going away weekends to bases, marine bases, warships. So I really had a taste for the Navy. My dad was in the Army. My brother was in the Army. And the Army didn't interest me. The, the Navy did. Mm. So that's why I ended up. I signed up at 15 and a half years old. Actually, I took, my mother took me to the um, career office, expecting me to do great things. And uh, there was a test called the NAMIT test, Navy Arithmetic and English test. And five being the lowest, one being the highest, I got five fives. <laughs> which is the lowest, obviously. <laughs> and the, the recruiter said, well, I've got some great news for you. You're in the Maxis Royal Navy, which I went, yay. And he said, uh, well, you're not going to be a pilot. You're not going to be a doctor. You're going to be a cook. And I'm like, yay. He looked at me like I had three heads. And here <laughs> I am at 54 years old doing the same thing I did way back when. So um, it was a destined thing, I think. That's great. What was it like you had experience uh, serving on the royal family's yacht, the Britannia? What was that experience like? And very, very classic English. If you think about upstairs, downstairs, you know, uh, and I mean that in the nicest possible way, there are servitude servants. Uh, and even though I was in the military, I was cooking for a family and a crew. Um, so I think for me, just to be in the presence of royalty, to, to serve the highest family in the land, as it were. Um, it was a very honorable job. Uh, my father was not a lover of my, my choice. In fact, my father didn't talk to me for two years when I joined the Navy as a cook, mm. because he felt it was beneath us. Um, in those days, it was almost like, yeah, again, I, I use the word upstairs, downstairs. Um, we, are, we were serving somebody. It wasn't until after a couple of years that my dad went to a, a garden party of a two-star admiral, and then he realized that his food business is a really cool business. Mm. Um, we mended our relationship, and, and again, here I am, you know, many years later, still doing the same thing. <clears throat> I think in England at that time, you know, cooking and waitressing and, and all those kind of things were not deemed, you know, the right kind of job. They were, they were beneath a lot of people. Um, and for me, never. I think it's, it's probably one of the best jobs you can ever have. Mm. Mm. That's great. I, I, and one of the things I was curious about learning was when you left the Royal Navy, what that transition was like. And I'm, I'm assuming you knew you wanted to continue this work, but I'd love to learn about that transition to your own civilian career. So one thing I think that, that all our military members need to understand that are serving in coalition forces, not just English or American, but coalition forces in general, is that when you know that you're about to leave or, or even join your service, you have to utilize what the military is giving you, i.e. the leadership skills is number one, because the majority of outside companies look for leaders. And there are very few and far between, uh, unlike the military, where that's what they teach you, to, to lead a body of men or women or both to achieve a common goal, whatever that mission is. The outside world doesn't do that. And we are not used to that. So the transition was very hard for me that, oh, I'm going to go into a job outside and somebody's going to trample all over me to, to get to that position that I want. The military... You know, you take your time, you do your exams, you, you bide your time, and you become that rank if you're, if you're good enough. So it was, it was a big shock to me to, to see that cutthroat behavior in the civilian world. Mm. 
and I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to continue to cook. But they're, you know, like acting. There are a thousand cooks, there are a thousand actors. What makes you different? And what set me aside was the skills of leadership that I learned inside the military. So when I traveled to the bases uh, 150 days a year that I do with the military right now, that's one of the things I always impress on people. Hey, whatever you want to be, if it's computers, if it's driving, if it's whatever it is that you choose, make sure that you get the skills, do online classes, everything you can take, take it. It's free. It's great advice. I mean, where else can you go into a company, get paid to travel, to get great friends that so become lifelong friends, um, and, and get taught as much as you can, can uh, absorb? That's nowhere. That's great. And I love, you know, I love this thought of like, what makes me different? I love how you're highlighting the the difference between career progression in the military and very different and can be very much more cutthroat in the civilian sector and having to be more proactive. And I love this sense of like just really taking advantage of this rare opportunity to have access to a lot of free training and a lot of great resources and really exploiting that while one's in the military and making full use of every opportunity because they are, it is incredible the amount of opportunity that we're presented with. But it is, it is, and we don't see that as young men and women, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. Yes, we go in, we do our MOS, we, we enjoy what we do, we have fun, but we really don't think about what the end is. And some people end up doing four years, some people end up doing 24 years, and, and so on and so on. But I say the same thing. The qualities you learn in the military will serve you triple when you get outside of the military. Mm. And, it, and it's pretty awesome to watch because I've done it. I've been through it. But it was a hard transition for me because you're used to telling people, do this, do that, and they do it. In the civilian world, they don't necessarily do that. <laughs> and I learned that in Jamaica. I learned that in Atlantic City, in casinos. You know, 15 minutes early is really 15 minutes late. Mm. All the things that we're taught about taking care of each other, the cleanliness of your equipment, your uniform, be proud, and all those, those great things. Um, you take it to the outside world with you and you create the opportunities when you, when you leave the military. Mm -hmm. You never leave the military, by the way, because we know that, but when you exit, um, you are in charge of your destiny. That's great. Another thing I wanted to ask about is mm -hmm. you have a personal mantra that nothing is impossible. And I respect this even more because in the just incredible volume and amount and breadth of work you do, you're, you're really embodying that principle. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about that. I'm sure part of that came from your military service, but I'm, I'm curious to learn where that mantra came from and what that means to you that nothing is impossible. Well, for years, and that's a, that's a great statement. For years, um, when I came out of the military, I was a young guy had very different ideas, um, could see things and how to make things better in, in any company that I worked. And every time I would go to Superior and say, hey, you know, just so you know, I think I know this is what we do, but I think this is a better way to do it. I would always get shunned away and like, oh, be quiet. You, you know, you're new here kind of thing. Uh, to the point that it's very frustrating to me. I would then move jobs or I would uh, go to their boss and say, hey, listen, I think I can save you 28% of the bottom line of your business. All of a sudden, people take notice and they give me an opportunity. Uh, Donald Trump was one of them. Arthur Goldberg was another one of them. So I would say, hey, there's a restaurant underperforming. Could we do this? Yes, try it. If it doesn't work in three months, we're going back to the old way. It worked in four weeks. Mm. And I think... The attitude, the attitude that the military gives you, and it's kind of interesting, if you think in the civilian world, we make a plan to achieve a goal. In the military, it's a different way. We reverse it. We say, here's the end goal in mind. This is and reverse our way backwards to the plan of how it's, we're going to achieve that goal. And that's the way I look at life. Somebody says you can't do it. Okay, why can't we do it? In your opinion. 
and I, and I break their mob skills down and say, well, there is a way to do it if we do this. And a prime example of that is our protein bar. When somebody said, oh, we can't, we can't bake a protein bar. And I said, well, why not? It's like a cookie, right? We make baked cookies. So instead of saying, no, we can't do it, it's impossible, I put uh, three pizza ovens at the end of a, a line and baked cookies and made a protein bar once the cookies are cooled down. Now we're, now we're one of the, I think we're number three uh, in the land of, of uh, protein bars. Mm. So I, I just think it's, there's always a way to break something down. Mm. When somebody says no, that's like a red flag to a bull to me. You know, I've got to exhaust every opportunity to prove that they're wrong, not to them, not to make them look bad. For me, as a challenge to me to say, well, here are the obstacles. The military has taught me to do this. Let me look at the options. And touch wood, everything I've done, I, I attack like that, including restaurants, food lines, helping people on the shows. You know, what is the, the end goal in mind and work backwards? That's that's so great. And what I especially love about that is I think that a misperception that many civilians have about people who serve in the military is that they're just following orders. And what I love about what you're demonstrating here is this questioning attitude, this attitude that's not willing to accept no or not willing to accept a perceived or stated limitation as fact, you're really willing to question that and try to find every possible avenue to find and forge a new way. And that's, that's, I imagine that's not easy when you're working with someone and you're literally trying to do what to them seems impossible. But I also think that it hints at how you've achieved so much in your career because you, like with your protein bar, you are continuously challenging the status quo and that allows you to seize opportunities and make new ones. That's really inspiring. And I think if you look at, thank you, I think if you look at, you know, um, civilian organizations, and, and I know because I work with Comcast, I work with American Airlines, I work with Walmart, I work with these big companies um, that have now started to see the value in the leadership qualities of our veterans. Comcast, NBC Universal, for as a prime example, they've had to change the way they interview veterans. Why? Because here's what a veteran does. He goes in, he's told to keep his mouth shut, they sit in an interview, they're not supposed to say anything because that's the way we're trained. Mm. And when you do an interview, it's like, oh, well, he's not very energetic. He's not, or she's not, or they're not the right fit. And we literally had to say, um, hey, listen, just so you know, this is the way the military's trained. They're not, they're not used to sitting in an interview and discussing things that you're discussing. So we have to retrain the interviewers to interview military folks. Mm. That's the same with Americans, the same with Walmart. Um, uh, in fact, Comcast hired a brigadier general, as did Walmart, to run their veterans initiatives. And it was so awesome um, to see the change and adaptability of those major companies. Uh, Comcast, I think, is this, by 2021, they'd have hired 21,000 veterans and spouses, uh, which is amazing. Um, Walmart, till this year, Brigadier um, Gary Prophet, Brigadier General Gary Prophet, just retiring, but hired 226,000 veterans for Walmart which is amazing, again, because they've not settled for mediocrity. There is a right time and a wrong time um, to challenge, okay? And, I, and I've done a few wrong times, um, but we can't really do, we can't really do, do the wrongs. You've got to do what you're told, listen, then when you finish the job, go back and say, sir or ma'am, I thought about this, what do you think? And again, you're going to have people that fight you, but as long as you continue to change and learn and adapt uh, and have a great attitude, people will always listen to you. Mm. It may be a fight at times, but you can't give up individuality because somebody above you in the civilian world doesn't like what you're doing or gets threatened by what you're doing. Mm. And that's a big thing I find. People get threatened. That's great. I, I mean, I, I think it's great to hear the changes in the employment environment. I think you're, you're providing great advice as well. Um, 
Another thing I wanted to ask about is you are on the road 345 days a year, which, which first of all, makes me even more um, humbled and flattered that you're taking the time to speak with us on this show. But it also makes me wonder, how do you do it? Like, how do you prevent burnout? And what advice do you have for people about being able to maintain such a high pace of operation? I think, first of all, um, I love what I do. Um, the, the, I get to spend, uh, you said, 345 days. That is a real number. And I've done that for the last several years. Um, filming TV, I have 150 days where I travel with the military, USO tours. In fact, this Thursday, we'll have 40 families and TAP, Tragic Assistance Program for Survivors, Gold Star families coming to Vegas. So I have a weekend with those of cooking and, and uh, shows and uh, spending time with, with you know, like-minded folks that uh, care about each other. I think to me it's an excitement, um, the, the tiredness and, and the pace um, are outweighed by the good that we can do. Um, you know, it's so funny when I get tired and I'm on a plane and somebody wakes me up and says, hey, can I take a picture with you? Or a serviceman comes up to me that I met in Afghanistan in 2013 uh, and says, hey, remember this picture? Uh, that, that gives me energy. It gives me excitement. It, it, it drives me. Um, and my good friend, Shanice, always said, there's always more we can do, you know, and as much as we try, there's only so many hours in a day uh, to be able to do it. And, and I keep pushing the team to give me more hours. Um, I think when you feel good about what you do, um, it, it just makes a whole difference. Uh, I was just in Chicago with the Secretary of the Army um, talking about uh, recruitment and, and cooking classes and, and uh you know, to me, anywhere we can touch, and I said this a second ago, if we can make a difference in one person's life every day, then we've achieved what we're supposed to achieve on this year. It's not always about us. And, and years ago, 10, 12 years ago, when I got my first TV show and, you know, I thought I was the man, the myth, the legend. And by the way, that was only in my mind, and I really wasn't. Um, and something re I realized that, hey, this is a platform that we can use to really highlight others. And, and when you become successful, and you can ask any successful person, all of a sudden there's a selfishness that, that overcomes you that says, hey, I can get a new car, I can get a new house, I can pay my bills, I can, I, and, and, and there's, a, there's a theme here, I, 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 you know, and not we, 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 we. Um, and that changed 10, 10 years ago or so. And I realized that this platform was huge and getting bigger uh, and then we could actually affect change in people's lives. That's why the show is, is what it is. And um, I do what I do because I truly, truly enjoy, you know, you said food is, is my passion. It's actually my second passion. My first passion is the military. Uh, food is the vehicle that allows me to do and get to do what I do within the military. Um, and I'm blessed that I've got that talent, but it came from the military, not the food piece, but the leadership, the love of, of, of service men and women um and there's never enough time in the day because i want to do it more and more and more i i get this impression as you say that this like really strong sense that serving and giving back it, it's it's a way of getting leverage in one's life it sounds like you know it's it seems almost counterintuitive to me that doing all of this work to me like my mind is telling me man that would make me feel more exhausted that would make me have less time and more stress and what i see in your example is the opposite that as you serve as you give more and more it's actually giving you more fuel it's giving you more energy it's giving you more drive and what i respect about what you're saying is that you know it seems like if if someone's mission is driven by self-service and themselves, it's it's going to be limited impact. But if you're able to approach it more in in that we perspective of giving back and generosity, that the impact is far greater. And that's really really incredible advice for all of our listeners. You know, it, it is. And I, as I said, I went through that I I am phase, and to me, it's, it's really energetic when. And I, I say this again and again, when, you know, our military is 1.4 active duty men and women and 1.2 12 month um, deployed guard and reserve folks. So I get to, you know, last week I, I uh, brought 350 National Guardsmen that were attacked to third ID 
back from Afghanistan after nine months. They're a tough nine months, too. Um, but I, out of that plane full of, of National Guard and 350, I probably knew 349 of them. You know, and, and I get such a high from that um, to welcome them home and, and say, hey, listen, we cooked the barbecue for 1,500 folks. And it, it's, if I could do it full time, 345 days a year, guess what? I'd be doing it 345 days a year. Uh, we hire veterans. We work with veterans. We work with families. We, we, we work with maybe exchanges and commissaries and, and uh, chairman of joint chiefs and secretary of defense, secretary of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. All those, those folks that we work with is not, is not to sell product, is not to, to, um, to self-propel. Uh, it's literally because I think our military has the best leadership in the world right now since World War II. Mm. It really does. And the change that's about to happen, not only in the food space, but the, the equipment space, the morale space, um, our military is going to be great again because of, you know, the, the Secretary of Defense, um, uh, Secretary of the Army, uh, General Milley, uh, General Dunford, all these folks that are, that are really amazing that have started change. Now, remember, the military has gone through this whole change, 18 years at war. You know, when we were, when I was in the military, you know, uh, it was completely different. The, these are athletes now. We, we are sending them on longer deployments, away from the family. Uh, now we've got to really start to take care of them, not only when they come back, but while they're actually deployed and take care of their families. And I think now, and I really believe this in my heart of hearts, that right now, these last couple of years, we started to see the, the, the wood for the trees. We started to actually think, oh, listen, we need to do this, this, and this, because our folks are hurting there. You know, the Vietnam veterans never had that. Um, and, and now we're starting to get them, thanks to the senior leadership saying, hey, we need help from the, the civilian world as well as our military world. And it's so funny when you, and, and, and this ties in so well, when, when the military asks for civilian help most of those civilian helps are former members of our military that have been there, done it, wrote the book on it, played in the movie. You know, they, they, they've lived and ate that stuff. So it's really helpful when they go in to help fix problems or, um, or, or chat about things that they've been there and understand the lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And it leads into another thing I wanted to touch on is it, it really is inspiring to see all of the amazing work that you're doing for the, the military veteran community and how regularly you're appearing at events. And like you said, 150 USO events, it's, it's, it's really incredible. And a lot of this is done through the Robert Irvin Foundation. Um, what would you like listeners to know about your foundation? And also, is there any way that they can support you in the work that you're doing? I think the foundation was born from uh, about five, six years ago because I want to do that, that adult, I want to do more. We're always supplying chefs and food and, and time. Um, and I felt we could do more. So we started the Robert Irvine Foundation. Uh, in December of last year, we reached our first million dollars uh, given away, which was, again, a milestone for us. 100% of that money went out, um, which is great. So. I'm paying for the foundation out of my own pocket. Uh, our executive director is a uh, special forces guy, David Reed. Lost his leg in Afghanistan in 2010. Um, we buy dogs. We send people to the World War II Museum. We, we give out grants. And you can see it on the website, robertervinefoundation.org. We're very transparent. Um, we do some amazing things. Sky Ball in October every year. We feed 12,000 folks the biggest hangar um, in the world. All the cooks from the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, and Coast Guard are assigned to me for a week, for all the senior level chefs. And we cook under tent for all these wounded warriors, the caregivers, and uh, families. Then we do Snowball Express with Gary Sinise and Disney, uh, where we take the 2,600 kids of Fallen Heroes, and we give them a week at Disney. So there's an awful lot that we do that, again, people don't know because it has I don't want it to be self-serving. I do these things because we love to do it. Every one of our products, our liquor, um, we have the largest distillery in Pennsylvania, Lansdale. That's called Boardroom. Everything on the bottles, everything on our food products, our protein bars, 
say, hey, a portion of these proceeds goes to the Robert Irvine Foundation. Um, that's what we do. We just, again, the more we can do, the more we sell, the more we can give away, the more I can sleep at night on planes, trains, and automobiles. It's just a great way to live. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I know that we, we only have a few minutes left here, and I always like to leave the last question open-ended. And you can take that either as, what have we not covered that you want to make sure listeners know, or any final words of wisdom that you want to leave them with? I just want to shout out to all the men and women in the families who were the top of this nation. What you do daily affects the rest of the world. It gets monotonous sometimes, it gets boring sometimes, it gets exciting sometimes. But remember one thing, the minute you wear that uniform and only 1% of America chooses to do that, you're representing us and we care, we love what you do, we love your families and we're here to support the mission. And I will see you somewhere around the world, no matter where it is, Afghanistan, Iraq, Poland, Spain, Djibouti, Diego Garcia, you'll see Robert Irvine. When you leave the service, Go into the civilian world and do magic. Create your own destiny. You be the leader that you have been taught to be and bring greatness to the civilian world. Go out and do it. That's all I got. That's so great. Robert, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for the incredible work that you're doing, as well as just the inspiring example of someone who is being more and really pushing the limits of what people believe is possible. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Quick couple admin points. Um, We release brand new episodes every single Monday and Thursday. Those are usually recorded uh, about a month or so before they go live. Um, And um, every Monday and Thursday, we have an interview, usually almost always with a military veteran about their civilian career. More and more, we're starting to add in experts who may not be veterans, but may have some expertise that will help the military veteran community. Um, Saturdays, I typically post more of a behind the scenes episode, which is a free form format. I try to use what I'm calling a mullet format. And by that, I mean business up front, party in the back, uh, talking through admin points, uh, professional topics related to the podcast. It might be a conversation I had that week. It might have been an interview I had that week, but just trying to, to share things that are top of mind that may help you in more of a free form, straight from the heart format. And then the party in the back is the personal side of things, just kind of more free flowing uh, thoughts on life, on um, uh, improving oneself, just kind of whatever's going on in life and trying to be authentic and um, honest about um, those things as well. Special thanks. We have an all volunteer army of people behind Beyond the Uniform making this possible. Uh, We do this on our lunch breaks, on our evenings, on our weekends, because we love the military community. We want to give back. We want to make a difference. We want that as part of the purpose in our life that we we valued in the military. Um, So special thanks to Steve Bain. Steve does pretty much everything. He helps uh, secure guests. He does our newsletter. He keeps the reels rolling and keeps me sane. Kathleen Dillon, the first person to join our team. She writes text transcripts of every single episode. It's wild. She keeps up with two of these a week despite a demanding career and education right now. Uh, But those transcripts help us get more SEO value, helps her audience more. Um, Andrew Woolridge is our data guru. He helps us understand the numbers, which is the easiest way for us to figure out how we can better support you and um, adds kind of the, the data oversight for that. Rick Healy does all of our social media. He is gaining more and more of an audience for us by getting our videos, getting our podcasts out on social channels. Um, The best way to stay in contact with us is if you go to beyondtheuniform.org, there is a newsletter. You'll have a little pop-up that comes up. You can put your email in. We email twice per month. We try to be respectful, but it is a great way to get uh, appraised of upcoming events, 
upcoming interviews, promos where companies are giving discounts to Beyond the Uniform listeners, and more. Uh, this does cost money to put on. We are um, con- uh, committed to not charging veterans directly. Um, and the way that we kind of offset costs is through corporate sponsors. So if you know of a company that would like to get in front of a military audience and their families, uh, that's one way that we can both add value to our members, but also offset the costs of Beyond the Uniform and give us a little bit of budget to start expanding what we're doing. So that's the, the best way you can help us. If that's not something that you can do, a positive review on iTunes is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful week. We will be back Monday, Thursday, and Saturday with more interviews. And uh, yeah, keep up the, the, the listening. Take care.